Our next speaker gives us permission, perhaps a mandate, to just sit back and daydream. So, take a breath, relax, let your mind wander, and please welcome Tor Mirren. Thanks right. so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I read something recently. Um, they, they, there was a poll of 1,500 of the top CEOs in America from all different industries. And the poll found that the number one leadership competency of the future is creativity. And at first, this kind of tripped me out. Um, I, I, it didn't quite make sense. But if you think about it, we really don't make stuff here in America anymore, right? We can't really compete on, on price. So we're not building shit, you know? Um, what we do do is, 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 is we're, not, we're not a manufacturing country. However, we're an idea country. So the idea is still king, probably now more than ever. Um, so today, I want to talk about cultivating creativity in the workplace. Um, because if these CEOs are looking for creativity, I've got a little bit of bad news for them. Um, there's two sort of intelligence tests that are given very commonly in the US. One of them, of course, is the IQ. Another one's called the CQ. Right? So uh, the good news is the intelligent quotient, um, the IQ, has gone up for as long as they've given the test. And it continues to go up. Um, the bad news is that, uh, and the CQ has been given since the 1950s, over the past five years, for the first time ever, creativity in America is going down. Um, so why is that? I think it's because creativity takes two things. It takes time and it takes nurturing. And I don't think the workplace offers either one of those things. Um, I call this the daydreamer's dilemma. Um, you know, we don't really just hang out, sit in the park, and just let our minds wander anymore um, with nobody looking over our shoulder, right? Um, and, and nobody telling us what to do. We're too busy um, and work's too hectic, right, for us to just, to just think about when you were a kid, right? I mean, this is basically my childhood in a slide, OK? Um, I mean, it was Yoda, you know, the little figurines and all his buddies, right? And I was taking them on adventures, and I was creating worlds with them. I had hundreds of these things, and I fabricated personalities for every single one of these characters, right? There were no boundaries to where my mind was going, and there was no one telling me what this people could and couldn't be. Um, and I ask all of you, when's the last time that you had the time to think that openly and creatively? And I'll give you a harder question. When was the last time at work that you had the time to think that openly and creatively. Um, whenever I don't have time to come up with a good idea, I think about Abraham Lincoln. Um, he wrote the entire Gettysburg Address on the train ride to Gettysburg, right? But here's the catch. The, the train ride was two days long, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that dude was playing with Yoda for two days. You know, he's like, he's daydreaming, he's imagining, he's creating, he ends up writing one of the greatest speeches of all time, right? I'll tell you what he wasn't doing, though. He wasn't making calls on his cell phone, OK? He wasn't returning emails. And he certainly wasn't doing this, right? Um, I mean, it, it, this, is, this, is, this is a wonderful thing, and it's a terrible thing. Um, you know, go to Starbucks. Nobody's really enjoying their coffee, right? They're, they're, they're typing. Not because it's bad coffee. They're typing, right? And they're texting. And they're updating their status, right? They're on Twitter. And you know, I need to pee, right? <laughs> I just peed. This is where I pee. <laughs> Why am I peeing? <laughs> Look at this pee. And of course, my favorite, I'm good at peeing. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> um, I, uh, anyway. <laughs> um, so, I, I, um, I steal a, lot of my, steal a lot of my management philosophies from a, from a um, study that was done. It's one of the most famous studies ever on creativity. It was done in 1992, and it's called Creativity Killers. Um, the interesting thing about this is this was done with children. Um, and really, it was a massive study, and it just studied, it, it, it looked into exactly what are the things that most discourage creativity in children. There's something very interesting about, about this, because I'm not going to talk about children. I'm going to talk about adults. Um, but the first thing is surveillance, right? Hovering over kids, making them feel like they're constantly being watched. The risk-taking and creative urge hides. I'm just gonna do one thing, right? Welcome to the American workplace, basically, right? <laughs> We're always hawking over you, watching you punch the clock, right? Um, and, and I think that this really crushes um, the creative urges um, that, that people would normally have. Uh, I'm very inspired by an old client of mine, his name is Steve Wilhite, um, and he told me, you can't work on my business if you're afraid to uh, afraid to make heroic failures, right? And I, and I love that sentiment. Um, because by eliminating, um, eliminating the fear and letting me know it was okay to fuck up a little bit, 
we were able to do some really amazing things. Then I went, I left that job, I went and I <clears throat> was running um, the advertising for Cadillac. And uh, had my first big shot at a huge Super Bowl spot, you know, a couple million dollar production. This was my big chance. Um, did a rather edgy spot that, uh, it was um, a bit polarizing. And when I say polarizing, I mean like I was over here. I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> and then there was 110 million Super Bowl viewers over here that thought it sucked, <laughs> right? Um, so a few weeks later, we, we, we lost the $300 million Cadillac account. Um, the New York Times wrote an article and said that we, we lost the account because the spot sucked so bad and put my name in the, in the article, which was nice, I thought. Um, <laughs> and so I called Steve Wilhite and I'm like, hey man, how about that for a heroic failure? <laughs> you know? And he's like, it was definitely a failure. Um, so uh, a year later, I moved to New York uh, and, and, and was started to run a big agency there. Um, and the stage was perfectly set for my next heroic failure. It really was. I mean, the economy was falling apart. It was melting down. Nobody was trusting banks and, and, and Wall Street and, and, uh, and brokers. And, and yet we had to do a big uh, Super Bowl commercial for a, for a financial company called E-Trade, right? Um, and this was not exactly the right time to be doing that, but we had a very ba brave client. And both of us decided collectively, let's do this. So we rolled the dice on a talking, puking baby. Um, <laughs> in the financial sector, right? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I'm gonna play a quick film. A lot of people are like, aren't you too young to invest in the markets? And A, you know, a don't worry about it. I mean, you don't know how old I am. And B, I use E-Trade, so check it, click. I just bought stock. You just saw me buy stock. No big deal. I mean, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> Whoa. It's so easy, there are a thousand new accounts a day at E-Trade. E-Trade ads with the talking baby. You know the E-Trade baby? Guess what, today that baby was adopted by Angelina. In that E-Trade commercial with the little, the little boy that goes on and does his trade. No, that is just trade. sheer genius. E-Trade babies. And E-Trade, the E-Trade one. The little E-Trade baby. Love them always is that E-Trade baby. Oh, hold on, hold on, it's that baby that trades stocks. <laughs> I love this kid. That is a cute baby! Oh, what a bad girl. Frank, it was on the cart path. Why don't you try reading the rules, Shankopotamus? Well, he, he's a friend of my father's, though. <laughs> he is a terrible, terrible dancer. He's actually right, but what up, Mike? Hey, dude. <laughs> yeah, this is how he dances. <laughs> Day? Dude, no, 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 no. I want to punch the economy in the face. Mom puts me in timeout. This is bullshit. Complete bullshit. Oh, my goodness. Dude. Oh, oh I see. Solitary. <laughs> Just a man and his thoughts and a smartphone with an E-Trade app. You know, I mean, the boys were talking about what to do with all this extra coin. And I was like, I'm renting a clown. <laughs> and I did. I have Bobo here. And uh, I, I really underestimated the creepiness. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. So here we are, um, you know, almost four years later with that campaign, and, and too much surveillance. Believe me, going into something like that at the agency level or at the client level, that never would have happened. Um, so let's go on to the second creativity killer. Uh, which is over control. Uh, constantly telling kids how to do things often leaves them feeling like their originality is a mistake and any exploration a waste of time, right? And the simple change there is, right? Again, this is a huge problem, I think, because we all know the answers, right? When we're in management, we're, we, we, you know, we kind of force these proven solutions on our people. We don't really let them explore and find something that's maybe a better solution. Um, I think it's because we're all scared. It's a tough economy out there. You know, we're all freaking out. We're, you know, we have to be safe, safe, safe. And we have to be so smart. You know, every, everything we got to do is so smart. I mean, we got a smart car now, right? We got a smart phone. We got a smart bomb, right? We got fucking smart water, <laughs> right? So I have a rule. Once a day, you have to be stupid, okay? <laughs> Seriously, explore the ridiculous, you know? <laughs> Go to, go to really, really dumb places, um, and you'll be very, very surprised at what you find, because smart may have the brains, but stupid has the balls, <laughs> right? So, um, so here's something really stupid, right? So 
How about the baby is in a Skype conversation with his girlfriend, um, and his girlfriend's pissed off at him because he didn't call last night, and then his other girlfriend bum rushes that conversation, and her name just happens to be Lindsay. Let's take a look. So, yeah, sorry about last night. Yeah, I just don't understand why you didn't call. Yeah, well, I, I was on E-Trade, you know, diversifying my portfolio, taking control like a wolf. Right. <laughs> What's that? That's volatility in the market. <laughs> taking care of. Wolf style. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> and that milkaholic Lindsay wasn't over? Lindsay? Milka what? This is ridiculous. She thinks that that is so obviously her that Lohan is now suing e -Trick. Good luck with that one. Does she have a, a mental problem, narcissism, or is this a pure PR ploy? No way in the world I would ever let any of my clients file a lawsuit like this. It just seems kind of silly. I didn't even think of Lindsay when I saw that ad. Might be the tough one to prove. Yeah. Lindsay says she's suing you for $100 million because uh, your commercial hurt her career. What career? It's outrageous. So what is it? She heard Lindsay and Hollick and just thought... The actress has dropped her $100 million lawsuit against the brokerage firm E-Trade over a Super Bowl ad that featured a milkaholic baby named Lindsay. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so... Uh... I love how serious that last news clip is, you know, about like a milkaholic baby named Lindsay. Um, I don't know what this says about our country that there, this, this story was worth 50,000 50, big news story. I, it's, it doesn't say anything good about our country, by the way. But we got stupid and it paid off in this particular uh, time. Um, the third creativity killer um, is uh, competition, right? So putting kids in a win-lose situation where only one person can come out on top does not foster creativity collaboration does, right? And you can absolutely say the same thing about the workplace, right? And right now, I think, is the most collaborative era that we've ever lived in. I mean, and, and mostly because of the digital space. It's unbelievable, right? Um, uh, and, and, and not to mention that the millennials are now, they're now coming into the workplace, and we got to get used to it. It's a totally different mindset, right? I mean, I'm Gen X. It's all about me. But, uh, you know, the millennials are, are they're, they're, you know, uh, pure teamwork, um, and they really believe in the collective, and it's unreal um, what, these, what this younger generation is doing in the workplace. So um, this is our workspace. Um, you know, this is, uh, there's a lot of these humongous cork walls um, where ideas come together, put, put it up on the wall, and you can comment on any idea that's on the wall. So it's almost like YouTube comments, but in real life. Um, and, uh, and it's a really good way to just get people together and get things going. This is, uh, we have about 800 people at our agency. Uh, none of us have an office. Um, I'm a strong believer that walls, both, both literally and figuratively, um, stop ideas from going places, right? So I like a good, we all like a very good flow um, so that there's nothing to stop that idea from growing. You got a bunch of people in one room. They can all add on to that idea. Ideas are living things they want to grow to, right? Um, this is actually in our office. It's a bedroom. <laughs> um, I don't want to talk about the collaboration there. We'll move on. Um, <laughs> so this is, E-Trade is really kind of the uh, classic uh, click case of radical collaboration. I won't read all these, but this is, in a little less than four years, what's gone into that? Our client's name is uh, Nick Utton. He's an amazing guy. Um, you know, over 60 million YouTube hits it, uh, and, and, and 25 comedians, uh, tons of writers. Literally 800 scripts have been written for this. Um, and, uh, but all the spots end up being ad-libbed anyway, so that's kind of a weird number. Um, so, um, so, so really, E-Trade is the poster child for radical collaboration. Um, the collaborations going on in the digital space is, is phenomenal because everybody's out there, everybody can see it, and everybody wants in. So uh, with all the talk today about radical collaboration, um, I, I just have to say I'm talking about the creative process, and, and I need to talk about um, Howard Rourke, who's the architect, um, the protagonist in this book, right? Um, and, he's, and he does not believe in decision by committee, to say the least. Um, and he's at a party, and there's a very popular sort of art critic who's very kind of, um, you know, kind of, loves mediocrity, um, and he probably, th you know, he thinks Howard Rourke is probably a little bit resentful of him because he's not writing stories about Howard's work, and he walks up to Howard and he says, you know, we're alone now, Howard. You can tell me what you really think about me, and Howard says, 
but I don't think about you. Um, and I think this is actually a critical lesson in the creative process, because in the creative process, there is a time to be radically uncollaborative. And I mean this, um, you know, don't think about your critics, don't think about your friends, don't think about your boss, right? Just do something, you know, think about your heart and follow it. Do something that you really love and chances are it's gonna be pretty cool. Um, this is the last thing I wanna talk about. Um, I hate this, I hear this all the time. I hear this, I hear this in, in my industry, which is odd. I'm not creative, right? I don't even understand, what does this even mean? You know, all I know is that if you say this, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you say you're not creative, trust me, you're not gonna be creative. Um, and by the way, there's 1,500 of the top CEOs in America that the number one thing they're looking for is creative ideas, right? They want creative people. Um, so I wouldn't be running around shouting this from the rooftops right now if you want a job. Um, <laughs> But here's the dirty little secret about anybody that says this, right? I know a dirty little secret about them. They played with Yoda, okay? <laughs> they did, because we all did, right? Um, we all did this. We made the couch into this futuristic fort. You know, we, 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 we did the finger paintings that our parents put up on the refrigerators. We all did this. Picasso says every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up, right? Think about that. It's pretty amazing. So, so here we are, right? We're all grown up. Um, we live in this amazing time where anything's possible. And our creative quotient is falling, right? This is tragic. Um, so how do we overcome this? How do we overcome the daydreamer's dilemma? I have only one little hint at this, which is this is my little baby girl. She's a month old. Uh, <laughs> Her name's Reka. She's, um, she will not be the next E-Trade baby, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, but she's pretty awesome. And, um, and the way she looks at the world is just, it, it's amazing, you know? She, she's so interested in everything, and, and, and her eyes just, you know, the curiosity and, and the openness, and soon she, her little brain is gonna be inventing these worlds, you know, and playing, playing with Yoda and, and creating, well, probably not Yoda, because he's so out of fashion now, but, um, you know, creating art. And um, there's a writer, Eliz Elizabeth Stone, and she said, to have a child is to forever have your heart go walking around outside your body, right? And, and I, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, I, I, with Reka now, I totally understand this, but I also really, really believe in reciprocal relationships, okay? And you know, if she's gonna have, go walking around with my heart in her hands, I'm gonna wa go walking around looking through her eyes. Thank you so much.